I call him pioneer of PropTech in India, not because he went on to become the CEO of REA India after being the co-founder of PropTiger, but also he was the first one who solved the real problems of Indians that were facing during their home bank journey, holding hand during the time of the transaction. There have been a lot of brokering firms in the past, but none could scale the way PropTiger did. Of course, they also provided a lot of innovative technology solutions, and later, it's no surprise, his company, Elera Technologies, also acquired Makan.com and Housing.com. So today, at Reality NXT, we would like to welcome the dynamic Dhruv Agrawala. Thanks, Ritika. Appreciate it. Looking forward to chatting with you. I think residential real estate uh, is on the cusp of, of an upcycle. I think another big thing which has taken place is sort of increased digital adoption in this sector. So Dhruv, uh, last time when we had met during that time, the first announcement of lockdown had happened. From that time till now, things have improved. Things have gone better and multiple changes, of course, we have seen in real estate industry also. So how 2022 has been for you, especially personally and professionally? So Kritika, I think, uh, you know, if I look back uh, to around, you know, March of 2020, when the lockdown happened between then and now, I think it's two and a half years. Uh, I think a lot has changed. Uh, and, you know, if we look at real estate specifically hmm. uh, in India, residential real estate, uh, I think the industry has changed for the better, you know, significantly. So a couple of things there. One is, I think residential real estate uh, is on the cusp of, of an upcycle. Uh, you know, we've been struggling with residential real estate since 2013. And every time it sort of looked to come out of, of, a, of a downtrend, something or the other has happened. You know, 2016 was demonetization. Then in 2017, there was RERA and, uh, and GST, which all are good in the long haul and are actually helping the industry today. But at that time required some adjustment then there was the whole NBFC crisis, and then of course COVID hit. Yeah. Uh, so, however, I think COVID, in a funny way, has actually led to uh, you know the start of this upcycle. Mm. Uh, I think people were forced to stay in their homes for extended period of time, so they realized how important uh, home ownership is, uh, and uh, and and frankly, the relationship to a home for people has changed fundamentally. True. Uh, that I think has you know uh, driven demand for various things, various behavioral changes. One is people now are looking to buy bigger homes yeah. because work from home is a reality or at least hybrid work is is, is, is a reality. Second is they're looking for homes in, uh, you know, uh, smaller cities, tier two cities, you know, destination cities where in case something like this were to happen again, they could mm. find a safe haven to be in. Now, because there's work from anywhere, a lot of people have gone back to their hometowns and still continue to work from there. So I think residential real estate in smaller cities has also done well. Uh, real estate in uh, the periphery of large towns has also done well because now people are more likely to stay uh, at places which are not necessarily close to their place of work because they don't have to come to work every day necessarily. Uh, so that's also uh, changed. So I think fundamentally people's relationship to home ownership you know, has fundamentally changed, which has been good for the sector. Second thing is we have seen the benefits of RERA after so many years come in, where consumer confidence, you know, is there in the market now. Uh, they do trust the system and the process that if they were to buy property, uh, you know, developers would be held accountable for delivering on time. Uh, we've also seen uh, interest rates, of course, notwithstanding the recent rate hikes, uh, has been close to, you know, historic lows, which again has been good for home ownership. The government's provided you know, subsidies uh, in terms of stamp duty cuts in a few states. Plus, they've also extended the subsidy on interest on home loans for uh, affordable housing. So I think various initiatives, you know, have taken place, you know, which has also helped the sector. In addition to that, you know, price hikes, again, notwithstanding the recent price hikes, so pressure on uh, upward pressure on prices, prices have been relatively stable over the last five years. And in fact, if you compare it to inflation, uh, in real terms, prices have actually come down. That is when you adjust for inflation. So uh, overall, I think there have been many structural macro factors, uh, as well as you know consumer-driven factors, which have really driven residential real estate you know positively over the last two and a half years. 
I think another big thing which has taken place is sort of increased digital adoption in this sector. I think yeah. uh, residential real estate, amongst many other sectors, had been one of the slowest in adopting technology. You know, if you look at, especially in sales and marketing, part of the value chain where we belong, whether it was jobs, matrimony, auto, had seen adoption a lot quicker than real estate. But I think now, post-COVID, where everybody was forced to adopt the digital media for various things, I think adoption has taken place significantly, both in terms of uh, consumers and other ecosystem participants, such as developers, as well as uh, agents. So that I think has also been a big shift we've seen in the last two and a half years. So both both these things, you know, one is a the upcycle in residential real estate, which I think is here to stay, as well as this increased digital adoption, which again I think is here to stay. Both I think are great for uh, you know our business personally, uh, and I think for the overall real estate uh, sector. Personally, would you even say like you're looking great? I see a drastic change in you. Has there been a fitness journey in personal front? Yeah, so look, you know, uh, I think uh, COVID has been a period of change for, you know, for many people. I think in certain ways, for certain people, it's not been a great time. For certain people, it's been a moment of reflection. Where they've thought about things and rejig the way they lead their lives. I think for me, uh, I've sort of undertaken a personal, you know, uh, fitness journey of the last 18 months. And yeah, I think, you know, I feel... Uh, in uh, you know great shape uh, probably the best i feel in the last 15 years so in that sense uh, covid's also been a uh, you know a positive for me where it's allowed me to sort of take a step back reflect on what's important what's not important for me and i think uh, fitness is one area which has been uh, a big focus for me over the last 18 months and which is a big positive change in my life so you had stated two years ago during lockdown when I had interviewed you that PropTech market did not see a good capital flow and there were fewer startups. But in 2022, we are seeing a good funding is happening in PropTech market and there have been a lot of startups coming in. So what do you think how the funding scenario has been now for the PropTech market? So look, I think uh, Kritika, when we spoke, uh, I think you know my comment was more related to sort of relative funding in terms of prop tech not raising capital as much capital uh, relative to other sectors uh, and i think part of the reason or part of the reason for that was just the downturn in residential real estate which we had seen uh, since 2013 so when the underlying sector is still sort of witnessing a slowdown or it's not sort of you know seeing a recovery uh, which is robust obviously businesses built on that also don't see as much of capital flow. But as we've just discussed, a residential real estate has seen a recovery. Uh, and as I also said, I think it's going to continue for a while, this recovery. Uh, that would encourage investors to obviously deploy more capital in PropTech. That's part of the reason why we've seen more funding happen more lately. However, having said that, I think overall, as far as startup funding is concerned, we are seeing a slowdown relative to last year. Uh, because of the overall, uh, uh, you know, rising interest rate scenario globally. And we are going to sort of, as a, as a sector as well, you know, suffer from that. But again, you know, these ebbs and flows happen in startup funding as we've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that happen, you know, back in 2015 when things slowed down considerably. But then things bounced back, you know, stronger than ever before. So I'm pretty confident that uh, even this sort of uh, slowdown in startup funding, which is across the board, prop tech being no different, I think, you know, is, is going to continue for a while. But again, once it comes back, it's going to be stronger than ever before. Uh, you know, India fundamentally is, is a big market. It's an attractive market. Uh, given what's happening in China uh, for foreign capital, uh, India is a very attractive destination now. So I believe that uh, startup funding from a secular trend standpoint is going to see, you know, uh, strong growth over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, and PropTech is going to be no different just given the size and scale of residential real estate and real estate as a sector. You know, it is, uh, you know, the second largest employer you know, in the country, as we say, as a sector and, a, you know, significant part of our GDP. There's no reason to believe why, uh, you know, we won't see increased funding in this sector, even even in within PropTech is what I mean. Uh, and as I said, uh, part of the reason for why it was slow in the past was because of a slowdown in the sector and also a bit of lack of adoption of digital technologies in the sector, which has changed. 
Yeah. So given the up cycle and the fact that we've seen increased digitization post COVID, I think mm-hmm. PropTech will see uh, a lot of investor interest going forward. Since we are discussing about funding in PropTech sector, uh, what are the plans of REA India for the next four or five years? Do you have any particular sectors or companies in mind which you are exciting for? So look, uh, Kritika, as far as uh, REA India is concerned, you know we are we are extremely you know bullish. Uh, on this sector uh, and we've been investing you know, significant amounts of capital in our business over the last uh, several years and we will continue to invest uh, as we see the sector growing and, and our business growing. The last two years have been uh, very very strong for us. Our platform housing.com uh, has achieved market leadership in terms of uh, audience growth and traffic. So if you look at similar web, uh, you know, which is a third party website, which talks about the leaders in terms of traffic on, on, on various platforms, uh, you will see that since October of 2021, housing has been at the number one position in terms of traffic. Uh, so that's been a great you know, win for us over the last, uh, you know, within uh, the last 24 months. Even in terms of brand recall, we as a company, you know, continue to invest in brand, to invest in product over the last two years, COVID notwithstanding, as a result of which we've seen our brand recall you know, grow significantly over the last couple of years. And even in terms of revenue revenue growth, you know, for our financial year, which sort of ends in June, uh, we recorded 92% growth as, as a company. Uh, so for us, it's been a very good two years in terms of business performance. Uh, and we remain very excited about the sector going forward. Uh, India is a key growth pillar for the REA group overall and and, and we will continue to uh, invest and grow in this sector. So as we are talking about the prop tech sector, so everyone seems to be focused in building their own prop tech ecosystem like InfoEdge backing 99 acres, there are Square Yards, Anrock, Broker Network and Abhinandan Lodha backed companies like Zanadu, um, Multi Living, Bonito Design. So we are seeing a, a bit of a play of ecosystem at your end too. So in the race, what do you think will be the key differentiator? Look, one of the things to keep in mind, uh, Kritika, is that as I mentioned, uh, you know, real estate is a large sector. It is a large chunk of a GDP. It is you know the second largest employer, which makes it a big market uh, for various players to uh, do well. Uh, I think the various names you've you've taken uh, all are operating in certain different parts of the market. As far as uh, a platform business is concerned, in terms of people searching for real estate and looking to buy online, there are a few players out there, you know, including uh, housing.com. And I believe that the biggest differentiator in this sector for anyone is going to be, uh, at the end of the day, consumer experience. Uh, you know, buying a home, you know, continues to be a challenge for consumers. Uh, it is one of the most important purchase decisions of their life. Hmm. It is emotionally charged. It is the most expensive purchase decision they make. It is something where the cost of going wrong is high. It is a process which is fraught with a lot of nerves. And the experience, frankly, even today is still not the smoothest. It's still not hassle free. So anyone who can provide that hassle free experience to the consumer hmm. and provide a experience where the consumer is delighted hmm. i think will be emerge as the uh, winner in the space but having said that the space is so big it can accommodate you know more than a single player who's trying to build their own sort of uh, ecosystem uh, it's just you know, the scale of the country the just the geographical spread and we are yet to see the tier 2 markets play out which i think over the next 10 years are going to become big markets in their own right the opportunity is, is big for multiple players to, to succeed, include us. So I want to understand and make me understand about this, uh, the prop tech sector, where I'm looking at all the companies, the ones which I've mentioned, everyone are opening a different verticals under them. It's a huge umbrella of solutions provided. But in coming time, do you think our prop tech sector is still fresh rather than having a complete lot of verticals under us? Don't you think later on it might create a monopoly business or monopoly key players which are holding the major chunk of the market? Firstly, look, I'm not a great fan of monopolies. It's never good for the consumer. Uh, It's always good for consumers to have choice, which is very, very important. And which is why 
I always like the idea that there are more than one, uh, you know, there's more than one player because it keeps uh, all of us intellectually honest and keeps us on our toes, which ultimately is good for the consumer. But having having said that, there are certain businesses which do tend to have a few players, you know, which the consumers can go to. I mean, if you look at food delivery uh, today, you have Swiggy and Zomato. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very hard, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, five more players to do well in this space. True. Yeah. I and mean, if you look at e-commerce, right, you know, you have, uh, you know, Flipkart and you Amazon, have yeah. Amazon. And even the others who are trying to make inroads, mm. it's, it's not going to be straightforward for them. I mean, you have uh, Geo trying to, uh, you know, uh, make inroads, but of course they are well capitalized, so True, I'm pretty yeah. sure they'll do a good job. But it's still tough. You will still won't see five, six, seven players out there. I think the same goes for digital real estate. You know, when people are searching for homes, whether it's for buying a home or renting a home, or, or if there are owners who are looking to sell a home or rent out their home, you're not going to have, you know, 10 digital players, you know, doing that. You're going to only have a few. So many of the names you've taken are, are not digital real estate players in that sense. Mm. They are part of the real estate ecosystem for sure. Uh, but they are functioning more like a traditional bricks and mortar business hmm. in terms of, you know, marketing companies which truly function online. Hmm. There are only a handful of players and it's going to be very difficult for uh, new players to disrupt that, at least in the immediate future. Uh, but again, you know, we are ultimately, uh, you know, in the, in the tech business uh, and we are always looking at new models which are out there and could potentially disrupt us. So in that sense, we're not complacent. Uh, but yes, we also do recognize the fact that in this sector, you're not going to see a lot of players emerge, at least on the search and marketing side, because once brands are established and people are getting the right experience, it's very hard for uh, too many players uh, you know, to coexist. But we st still believe there's enough room for at least three or four players to do well. Also, I feel through, as you mentioned uh, about this particular sector, I feel in the end, it's about selling dream homes or buying dream homes, right, for the consumer. So in the end, I feel it's also about the trust. No matter how much we go in the tech adoption, in the end, the consumer, you have to have a transparent, good trust. So the monopoly game for this particular sector, I feel, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's not going to happen because in the end, it's going to be the home buyers, the home seekers, where you have to create that trust with them. I don't think, uh, you know, monopolies are good to begin with. As I said, I have a dislike for that word to begin with. And as I said, the sector is big enough, uh, you know, for uh, three or four players to coexist. At the end of the day, consumers will go to that platform where they find the best experience. And I think you rightly identified, you know, trust as a key factor. People will go to those platforms where they believe they can find the right home for themselves where, and even for the homeowner where they feel that they can get the maximum uh, you know, number of consumers who are willing to buy their home or rent their home out uh, and get the best price for that. So I think trust is a key factor in, in buying a home just given the size and scale of especially in, in, a, in a home purchase decision and whichever platform can create the maximum trust with consumers will do better and that trust will happen when actually consumers have come and experienced it and mm. feel that the experience is positive and you know a lot of work, positive word of mouth then kicks in. So as you mentioned you know um, recently RBI repo hike is there and it, it is affecting the home loan interest. So do you feel the upcoming festivals which are going to come Dhanteras, Diwali, will we see a huge shift or a drastic change in terms of buying? Look as I said Kritika I think uh, you know we are on the cusp of an upcycle in real estate you know, there's a lot of pent up demand in the minds of consumers who want to buy a home. And as I said, that fundamentally people's relationship to a home has changed. So while the rising interest rates could be somewhat of a dampener, uh, I don't think it's going to derail what I say, you know, what I call it as the upcycle in residential real estate. There's also an upward pressure on prices. Uh, as we know, input costs for developers have gone up and they have been forced to increase prices and we have seen those price hikes you know, across the board in various cities. But having said that, despite that, I think we are going to see uh, demand sustain. So far, uh, you know, we've been, uh, you know, four months into the new uh, financial year or in fact more than that. And I don't see anything sort of immediately on the horizon 
you know, which could uh, derail things. The rate hikes have been about one, about 1.4 percent. Yeah. You know, we could expect another 50 basis points to uh, about 90 basis points. Uh, it's hard to say over the next one year. Uh, but unless it goes beyond that, uh, I don't think we're going to see a major, you know, disruption in what I'm calling upcycle, which is here to stay. You know, we see that uh, on our platforms where demand continues to stay strong. Of course, you know, we, we are seeing far higher growth in rental demand than in buy demand on our platforms. But even for uh, for buying, uh, I don't see any change. I think developers have got a slew of launches lined up. Uh, demand has remained strong, uh, you know, for the quarter, which just, uh, you know, ended in, uh, in June. Uh, so my view is while uh, rising interest rates and rise in prices could maybe sort of decrease the slope uh, of the up cycle, I don't think it's going to derail it or cause it to go into a downward spiral at all at this point. So we have noticed Housing.com has collaborated with a lot of companies and to name a few like PropDial and MyGate, how's the synergy has been so far oh, with I regards to uh, property listing syndication? I think, uh, you know, with, with PropDial, uh, you know, we partnered with them to offer property management services uh, to homeowners, uh, you know, or, or landlords. Uh, that relationship is uh, working extremely well for us. I think it is an offering which adds a lot of value to both landlords as well as potential tenants. Uh, and we've seen a very healthy growth in consumer interest for that service on our platform. Uh, and I think PropDial is doing a great uh, job in terms of the service they are providing. That relationship continues to do well. Uh, with MyGate, it's still early days. Uh, this is something where we provided them a service. As you know, MyGate basically provides community or neighborhood app for yeah. societies to kind of, or for the residents of societies hmm. to manage security solutions for them, you know, pay society dues, etc. And there is also an option residents have to list their properties, you know, on, on MyGate, which then the relationship of MyGate with us is to allow those listings to actually show up on housing.com so that there can be inquiries, you know, from the whole housing.ecosystem, which can then be passed on to those uh, residents. That relationship, uh, you know, has started, uh, but it's still early days for that. Uh, but hopefully, uh, you know, over the next few years, we should see that relationship become strong and, and thrive. So as you correctly said, the major market will remain with broker. And after COVID, I've noticed huge chunk of brokers have easily adopted technology solutions, which provide a great lead for the developers and even great solutions to the customers. So do you think gone are the days where when we when we hear the word broker, the retail broker or the local broker image comes in mind. Now we have seen a different huge uh, in terms of communication technology. And so there's a huge plethora of in a change of broker communication yeah. and technology. So what's your take on this? See, Kritika, the thing is that, you know, as you mentioned, I think what you were insinuating was that brokers were sort of not seen in a very positive light in the past. Before. Yeah. Uh, I think that's 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 very unfortunate. Uh, you know, as in any industry, as in any segment, uh, you always have a few bad apples, uh, and you know they unfortunately end up uh, you know tainting the entire community. Hmm. I think brokers have been around for a long time. Uh, you know, in not only in India but across the globe, they continue to be an important part of the ecosystem, and they continue to play an important role. Uh, in this in this industry, uh, I think uh, brokers have now, as you pointed out, changed the way they operate. I yeah. think they were a little bit slower off the block in terms of adopting technology. But as I said, COVID has forced a lot of people across sectors, even in their daily lives, to adopt technology, and that has resulted now in brokers becoming a lot more friendly to technology solutions. Uh, so I think as we move forward. I think technology will allow brokers to become more professionalized, more organized and, and be able to actually appear more transparent because they will have access to information and data which then they can share, you know, with their consumers or their customers. And that's what we are trying to help them with, you know, become uh, better salespeople, manage their leads more effectively, uh, provide better service to the consumers. And we believe that this change which we've seen in the last two years in terms of digital adoption 
will help brokers to actually continue to add more value and actually start add, uh, adding further value to their customers. So I think it's just been very unfortunate that you know brokers have been in a certain light, but I think now going forward, uh, this adoption of technology will completely change that perception, and people will start seeing them as a critical you know component of the ecosystem who can actually add a lot of value. So talking about the leads, we have noticed revenue from lead generation businesses have affected real estate developers in terms of they are experiencing a constant decline. Uh, you know, every platform in this space is struggling to create or generate revenue. So what is the most effective pivot for this segment that you will be looking at to keep your revenue from the core offerings intact, especially for the housing.com and the makan.com? See, for us, uh, Kritika, we've actually seen, you know, more than, uh, you know, 100% growth in our, uh, you know, housing.com business uh, in the last one year. Uh, so in that sense, we're not seeing any decline. If anything, you know, more developers are adopting technology for lead generation, adopting platforms like ours. Agents and brokers are using our platforms more for lead generation. So if anything, revenue is only growing. And as this adoption actually becomes more widespread, we believe that for the next five to seven years, we are going to see a high double digit growth, uh, you know, in this sector overall. Uh, and if we take market share from competitors, you know, we can continue to see very, very high double digit growth rates for us. So in that sense, we are very confident that our core offering uh, is strong and is going to continue to show very, very strong growth over the next five years. So last year you had announced this collaboration with PropTile. So how's the synergy been so far with them? I think it's been great, uh, Kritika. Uh, so PropDial essentially offers property management services for landlords, uh, where they not only help them uh, find tenants, but also manage the property for, for the landlords. Uh, our partnership with PropDial was around listing PropDial as a service provider for property management services on our Housing Edge platform. Uh, and that relationship has been working really well. Uh, and we've seen demand for that service uh, grow steadily on our platform. So we are very happy uh, with uh, with the demand for the service and what PropDial is doing uh, in terms of being a service provider. So you also provide a lot of LI services. Can you shed some light on that? Sure. So, you know, uh, the platform I just mentioned, the Housing Edge, yeah. that basically is a marketplace of sorts for providing allied services, which are centered or focused around the entire home buying or home renting journey. Uh, so for example, property management is one for landlords, pay rent services mm. where you can pay rent, you know, tenants can pay rent to the landlords on our platform. Uh, you can pay utility bills on our platform. You can pay society dues on our platform. Uh, there is also packing and moving services, whether you've sort of bought a new home and are moving in or you've rented a new home or are moving in. There are solar rooftop services. You can get agreements made online. So various services or rent, rent agreements made online. So there are various services and various needs uh, which a consumer need, uh, which a consumer has during the home buying or home renting journey. And the idea of Housing Edge is to provide that one-stop solution where consumers who are buying or renting a home can come and do whatever is necessary around the process of buying or renting a home. And same thing for landlords or homeowners as they are renting out a home or selling a home, whatever services they need mm -hmm. and not just sales and marketing, uh, they can get on Housing Edge. So that's sort of the thought behind uh, this platform. Uh, look at the end-to-end -end home buying and home renting journey. So earlier we had discussed a lot about the prop tech sector. So in current scenario, which are the startups which you're proud of, where, where you think in, you know, believe in time that they'll be pushing the boundaries? I think, look, uh, uh, PropTech is seeing a lot of innovation, uh, especially in recent times. Uh, there are some startups which have come up uh, in the uh, home buying and selling space mm. uh, where they actually guarantee uh, the homeowner uh, the ability for them to sell their homes within a fixed period of time uh, at a certain agreed price. Mm. Uh, that I think is a huge uh, problem which homeowners have you know, when they want to sell their home within a given time frame and not able to do so. Some of these startups are catering to that. So I think that's that's a great model yet to be proven, but I think something very exciting. 
Uh, the other piece is around fractional ownership of real estate. Yeah. Real estate, as we know, is an expensive asset class, uh, and sometimes people just can't afford to get onto the ladder, as they say, of of investing in real estate because the ticket sizes are too large. But these fractional ownership companies are allowing consumers now, or potential real estate investors, to actually invest in real estate as an asset class in small, bite-sized chunks, which I think is a great uh, you know innovation as well. Hmm. Uh, and then you know we are obviously seeing you know a lot of work happening in services again around the home buying journey. Uh, you know we discussed uh, yeah. you know, Prop Dial as one example of that. Uh, so there are many others you know providing services around the home buying and home home renting journey. But I think as an ecosystem, uh, digital real estate is growing, especially post COVID, uh, and we will see a lot of uh, innovative models hmm. over the next uh, couple of years. Which I think uh, you know will make this space uh, something to to watch for in times to come. Currently, which book are you you know reading, and why would you recommend to our viewers? So I, I like to read quite a bit. The book which I'm reading currently, and I wish I'd read it sometimes earlier. I'd heard a lot about it, but but somehow never got around to reading it. Is the Almanac of uh, Naval Ravi Khan, which is basically a compilation of his tweets and writings by someone called uh, uh, Eric Jorgensen. I think it's a great book. I would encourage folks to read it sooner rather than later. I think there are some great lessons and wisdom for generally sort of leading a better, smarter life. Uh, so I would highly recommend that. So if you want to define Prove Agarwal in four adjectives, what it would be? Passionate, empathetic, ambitious, tenacious. That's great. So, if you need to choose one, which one would you pick to invest? Apart, of course, from the real estate domain, cryptocurrency, stock market, or mutual funds. This is not meant to be investment advice. So I think for you know for smart investors, I think they should look at diversifying risk mm. uh, and having a balanced portfolio. But I know you know what they are sort of leading to. I do believe in you know crypto you know as a legitimate uh, asset class. Uh, and something you know people should consider as part of the portfolio so i'm i'm pretty you know bullish on that uh, asset class uh, going forward i know things have not panned out yeah. as well in recent times yeah. but i'm still a believer but as i said this is not meant to be you know any investment advice mm. here so you know people got to make their own judgments and their own decisions true so what is the best advice that you have ever received from your mentor it can be recently or the from the time you have started your journey and it's been there with you you have followed that advice throughout look i mean you know mentors have obviously uh, you know shared lots and lots of wisdom and which is why i always tell people that have a mentor yeah uh, because these are people who you can uh, speak to completely you know uh, openly uh, they've seen the movie which is you know sort of been played before hmm. and and can give you advice you know from their experience so please do have a mentor i think the best advice i have received and i've always found it hard to actually implement that hmm. is about you know the really the art of saying no right we yeah. as uh, people tend to want to do everything uh, and sometimes spread ourselves too thin you know attention gets divided True. and we don't end up doing anything very well uh, so whether it's you know in terms of what you're doing as a business hmm. what you're doing in life i think it's important to focus and work on something which you're truly passionate about which excites you and which you know gets you you know bang for the buck uh, otherwise you get distracted you know when when you have too many things on your plate so i always am a great believer uh, you know of of focus and mm. that's been something which i found hard to implement but i've learned over the years but this is some of the best advice i got you know from my mentors that's actually the best advice to say no so what is the worst advice that you have ever received I think it's a great question. I I don't think any advice is really bad. Advice is always contextual. You know, people share advice based on a, their own experiences, their perception of the situation yeah. which you're in for which you're seeking advice. So really it's about, you know, listening to uh, you know, people assimilating what they are saying and then reflecting on that uh, and then making your own decision. So in that sense no advice is ever bad it's like you know not asking for advice i think is worse than than any advice which is given to you so always seek seek out advice assimilate and then uh, implement it and and make the judgment call no no advice is really bad it's always contextual true 
So this might sound a bit uh, scandalous, but I need to know from you if you have to rank these prop tech companies in terms of better leadership or future, uh, namely Anrock, Square Yards, Broker Network, Prop Tiger, and Investor Clinic. So look, obviously, I don't want to comment on Prop Tiger because it's uh, you know it's, it's it's basically run under you know my leadership. But you know, frankly, each of the companies you named are excellent companies doing some uh, you know great stuff for the ecosystem all led by very capable leaders uh, who I respect and from whom I I've, I've learned a lot and one of the things which I always tell people is be curious always keep learning uh, and there's never a good or a bad place to learn uh, mm -hmm. and you can always learn something from someone so I've seen what these leaders have done in their various businesses uh, and I've tried to learn as much as I can from all of them. So I would say a huge respect for each of these businesses and their leadership. So if you are an investor and you have one crore, where would you invest? Commercial, residential, land plot or weekend homes and in which city? Of course, it's not meant for the home buyers to exactly do that. Yeah, yeah again, look, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not advisory. Uh, it's not meant to be advice because, again, it's very situational depending on, I mean, if, if today you're buying your first home, then uh, obviously I'll, I'll say that, you know, uh, buy it uh, close to where, where you're working and where you see yourself longer term. And it's never a bad time to buy a home to live in. If I were to buy a home coming very personally, I would possibly, uh, you know, buy it somewhere, uh, you know, in Goa. I think a great, great place to sort of unwind, always a safe place to be in if, if, if something goes wrong the way it went during COVID. Hmm. Uh, that's what I would do personally. But again, as I said, uh, home buying is very personal, hmm. very situational. So everybody has to look at uh, look at their own uh, circumstance. But my fundamental belief is if you don't own a, own a home, do go out and buy your first home. It's never a bad time. You know, interest rates, whether they're going up or down, prices, whether they're up or down, ultimately you want to live in it for the long haul. Yeah. Always the right time to do it. I thought you would answer Kolkata as a city <laughs> you're from. So... Uh, stating Kolkata, which is the best thing you like about that city? Kolkata, oh the yeah. food, without 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 uh, without a doubt. Uh, I mean, even when I go now, uh, that's what I'm doing. You know, morning till evening. You know, mm. I, I do spend time with my parents, but unfortunately, I spend more time outside the home. Okay, you know, eating all the stuff I grew up with. So yeah. clearly, I think it's a foodie's paradise. So name three favorite dishes of yours then in oh, Kolkata. Interesting. Uh, so I, of course I love I love the uh, biryani, uh, which is I think very unique. I think mm. it's the only biryani probably in, in India which has potatoes in it, uh, which gives it a unique taste. Uh, second thing I would say is dhalmuri. Uh, again, something which is unique to Kolkata, which I which I love. Mm. And third, I would say is I, I didn't really grow up eating fish. But I would say that, you know, it's uh, prawn malai curry and rice. Okay. Okay. So I want to ask last, not the least, who has been your role model and why? So, you know, uh, again, uh, I don't have a single role model. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I always try and look at people who, mm. who've, uh, you know, done things, you know, in life, uh, who've achieved something uh, more than what I have. And what I can learn from them and you know different leaders have different things to teach and as I said you can learn anything from anyone it doesn't someone doesn't have to be supremely successful hmm. uh, you know for, 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 for you to learn from right I mean you know people who go about doing daily things in their life sometimes can teach you big lessons so for me I don't have a single role model uh, but I'm very very curious in terms of observing people and learning from their good habits and also then you know learning from what i believe they don't necessarily do very well because mm. that's also a great learning yeah. in terms of what not to do mm. so in that sense i don't believe in you know a single role model because sometimes it also limits you know your aspiration to that individual yeah so i think you have to really evolve mm. uh, into the best version of yourself uh, and that i think the best way to do it is by learning from all quarters from successful people and not so successful True. But coming from a business background, your business family background, in early age, would you say your role model was your father? Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, in, in terms of my entire value system and, you know, who I am as an individual uh, and the way I built my organization, 
I would say I've learned significantly from him. Uh, you know, in th- terms of being empathetic, uh, in terms of uh, not just focused on performance, but also how you achieve that performance. It's not just you know what you do, but how you do it, which is very important. And that I've learned. Thank you, Zuru, for coming to the Reality NXT platform. It was lovely having you, and it is wonderful to see your corporate office in person. Thanks, Pritik. I really enjoyed having this discussion, and thanks for having me on the show. Thank you.